Okay, let's not beat about the bush. We're doing solo. Uh, slight, slight peek behind the scenes, folks. We're doing solo for the second time because uh, reasons. So uh, second time's the charm, eh? <laughs> so, so we've had to scrap that episode, and now we're coming back to do this again, which means we have now both watched Solo twice for this project. And of all the films within this project that you perhaps want to watch twice, I don't think Solo would be the one <laughs> we would choose. Um, I will, however, say, and, and just my hot take remains my hot take, I still enjoy this film a lot more than I think I expected to. And even on a second viewing, I go, you know what? This is not the worst film in the Star Wars saga. So, cards on the table here. This is not the worst film in the Star Wars saga, but it is the most forgettable film in the Star Wars saga by a really long way. I think the problem with this film is it shouldn't be a film because what you have here is a really, really good Disney Plus limited series. Ten episodes, maybe two seasons. Give it the Andor treatment. And I honestly think... This would be fucking amazing. This would be top tier. You've, you've got the whole introduction to the dark underbelly of Corellia, and 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 you know who is Han Solo? Because I'm not. I'm I'm just ignoring this whole gets his name from the thing. But yeah, who is Han? Him growing up, the introduction to you know being a scoundrel. Then you've got him joining the military, being an Imperial pilot, flunking out, being sent to be a basically a, 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 an infantryman, a ground pounder, a. Um, you know, a, a mud trooper, I think, is what they call. I mean, that in and of itself is a really interesting little f- two, three episodes of a show. Then you've got going on his first heist with Beckett, uh, and you know, kind of learning the trade and, and, and introducing to all that. And, and you, you've got so many great little vignette moments in here, which are fantastic. But because it's a film, it's just like bam, 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 and it means, as you say, you've forgotten the good stuff. And the interesting stuff, because it's moved on to other stuff, which is less good and less interesting. Uh, this this should have been a series. I actually don't think we needed a Han Solo movie at all, or a Han Solo series. I think, as a character, he was really encapsulated in the films, and I think any expansion on him, much in the same way expansion on Boba Fett, doesn't work, because actually you see that maybe they're not the most interesting. And that's a big problem with this movie, is Han Solo is not the most interesting person in the Han Solo movie. Um, By a huge, huge, huge long way. Um, yeah. But what I, this I, I, film... will say, I will say, I, I just want to very quickly say, I will, I will say this film could be in, in, improved massively if you just took Han Solo out of it. So so the entire film is just how Lando and Chewie and, and everyone else kind of gets to know each other. And then you just bring Han in at the very end coming to the gambling thing. That, that's, that, that, that would be much better. <laughs> That is not to say it is badly acted. The actor who plays Han Solo is fantastic. I have no bad word to say about him and his performance. It is not on him that this movie is a bit... eh? He got the mannerisms down so well that at the time, uh, I recall someone did a deep fake where they basically put a young Harrison Ford's face over him. And... He's got the little mannerisms and the way he walks and moves absolutely down pat. But the thing which takes him out more than anything else for me is the voice. It's just it's just Harrison Ford. Harrison? Harrison Ford has a very distinct voice. And and, and that's perhaps the only thing which, which takes it out. But as you say, uh, Alden Ehrenreich's performance, absolutely amazing. Zero problems with it whatsoever. But it is fair to say this movie, this this film is good. It is not a bad film. It is a solid 6 out of 10 for me as a film. However, there are lots of better films that it's not delivering, is my feeling. There's lots of much better stories around the story that we are following. You know, Kira's story is really interesting, but we only see a bit of it from Han's point of view. And I have other issues with, with, with that character, but, you know, the Marauders are fascinating. Yes, please give me more content about the Marauders, but they're kind of like a bit side part. And, you I think, know... I think, I, think we find out, I think we find out more about uh, uh, Kira in the comic where we find out where she got her red arm. Oh, excellent, yeah. <laughs> Another red arm situation. Um, the train heist is excellent and was a really good, solid sequence. And the stuff in the casino with Lando was a really good solid sequence. And the war stuff at the start, I really loved. But they do not string together one cohesive film. What they string together is a load of jumping from A to B to C. It is like we are playing 
different levels of a video of the Han Solo video game and in each level you have to collect part of Han Solo so in this level tick you've collected the Wookiee in this level tick you've collected the Millennium Falcon in this level tick you've collected his blaster that's how it feels it's it's too procedural in its aims I think is the problem and that yeah. leaves no space for nuances or for breathing this film has no space for characters to really have conversations you know you could see Kira's double crossing betrayal like from the start of the film when she got left behind it nothing was subtle I don't mind that it wasn't subtle but don't then expect me to have some great oh wow what a cool man I hadn't you know I'm not that's not then going to give me any emotional response because you then haven't given the characters to have time to have those emotional conversations you know her saying to Han I'm just behind you. Okay, well, no one believed that except Han, but we then got robbed of a really good conversation between the two of them. I feel the act, I think, and that's what it is. And that's what it is. The actors in this film were not given the opportunity to act the roles. They played the roles, but they felt like puppets being sent on a journey rather than actors being able to give us the characters. I, I think uh, a lot of that. Or, or, I mean, this is, I think is all of the Star Wars films, with the possible exception of Rise of Skywalker. I, I can see uh, notes from the studio, very present. Uh, famously, this was originally to be directed by Philip Lord and Christopher Miller, who did uh, the Lego Movie, the Spider Man into the Spider Verse. Uh, who who I, I definitely think and Twenty One Jump Street, Twenty One Jump Street, and, and they can do a really good little ensemble piece with a lot of heart, uh, and 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 tell a great entertaining story i mean wikipedia describes this film as a space western and i would love to see their take on a space western i think they could have done something very cool you know firefly is a very beloved show for many of us but is of its time i i, I think you could do something really really cool and interesting and they have done cool and interesting stuff in that kind of space western space in the mandalorian and it, it would be fantastic but Disney had this problem at the time of hiring great directors who have unique voices and then getting pissy when they wanted to tell their stories. You know, it's got to be, you must fit into the Disney box and make the Disney film. And as a result, um, they get fired and it just leads to a kind of confused mess. And I think that's... I'm interested to see when we watch Rebels um, if we have the same situation where... um, because that was obviously very changed and the director was kind of ousted and stuff. I want to see if we have the same kind of opinion on Rogue One based on on this. Um, I don't think so, but that's because I know Rogue One better than I know this movie because this movie just... I think with this film, obviously Rogue One did really well at the box office um, and this one didn't. And this this was the first Star Wars film I have not seen at the cinema since I was old enough to see them at the cinema. And that isn't because I don't love Star Wars or love science fiction or fantasy or even, hey, I even like a good Western and a good war movie. But I don't care about Hound Solo as a character. As a character? I'm doing it now, Andy. I, I was going to say, we're just, we're just racking up as many pronunciations of Han Solo and words this episode <laughs> as we can. <laughs> um, uh, I want... I, um, I personally did not care about Han Solo enough to spend my 20 quid to go and see the Han Solo movie. Is the short of it? And I think there were lots and lots of people that felt the same. You have to think at this point in time when this came out, we he'd just been killed off in well, uh, I, Force actually, Awakens. Actually, let's, no, no, no. Let, let's actually go back to two, two. So this film came out in 2018, I believe. Yes. So, was it so as recently cast, as that? It was 2018. Let us cast us. So 2018. This is in the wake of the Last Jedi. Oh yes. Do you remember how utterly, utterly toxic the fandom discourse was? after that film came out online. I remember all the way through 2018, uh, for, for, and look, you know, we, we put our cards for the table, we, we both love The Last Jedi. Uh, there's a lot a of very, very... about it. We did. There's a lot of very vocal people, though, who do not like that film. And it became so incredibly entrenched and incredibly tribal. This was the first film that was to come after that. 
And I remember at the time, there was a lot of pushback. There was, oh, we have to send a message to get Kathleen Kennedy fired. There was a lot of other stuff going on around this film at the time, with Lord and Miller being fired. And then uh, you also had the news Colin Trevorrow was being fired around the same sort of time. I say fired. They, they, they decided to part and go different ways because of creative differences. They were fired. Uh, there was just a whole lot of other stuff going on in, in the zeitgeist at the time. So I really do feel that the scales were tipped against this film from the very start. Plus Oh, had. massively. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I think you, you had Disney, and I'll say panicking, but that's the wrong word because they're still making all the money on the fucking planet. But, you know, they've got, the, they, at the time as well, you have the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's the height of the Infinity Saga. They've just had uh, the first one, Infinity War, I believe. Um, uh, is that the first one? Well, no, you, you've got, you, you're building to this massive crescendo. The films are making billion dollars. And, and I think you have a situation where this should have been, well, it should have been a TV series. But if it wasn't going to be a TV series, it should have been a mid-budget movie. But Disney doesn't do mid-budget movies. It does billion dollar movies or it's a failure. And with all that expectation loaded upon it and the fandom being so fractious and just looking to kick up a stink for whatever reason. Uh, and... One, uh, I, I think there was some pushback at the time because, uh, you know, when we had uh, Carrie Fisher passing, the, the digital Tarkin, the digital um, um, Leia, uh, they were going like, oh, we promise we're never going to recreate uh, actors with digital ones anymore, so we're recasting instead. It, it was just a toxic mess out there. And I think a lot of that fed into why it performed so poorly at the box office. I don't I think-, think the film on its own is as bad as the box office suggests. I agree. The film is not as bad as the box office suggests. The audience had Star Wars fatigue, and this was the this was a point in time where Disney were churning them out. Like there was six months after the Last Jedi, and it was a year before um, Rise of Skywalker. Mm-hmm. You know that it's such a tight, compressed time when people were used to waiting three years for a Star Wars film. You know, in the age of the prequels, it was three years in between. Um, I think the the melting pot was was heavy and as you say i think it was massively stacked against solo and fundamentally this is an average mid-budget action movie it is not revolutionary it doesn't progress any stories because it's a prequel and we've literally in you know in in 2015 saw them kill off han solo anyway so for me I have to say this film watching it now reminds me a lot of the black widow film that disney made Hmm. No, that's, that's a very waited, apt comparison. That's they, very waited, apt, yeah. they waited too long to make the film about a beloved character, and they waited till after the character was ca- dead in mainstream canon to go and make a prequel. And I think the Black Widow film was actually better. I think it had more nuance, um, but obviously that had its own pandemic issues and and stuff. But I think read the audience and you know work out is this the time to be releasing this and but but as you say disney's not going to do that if it doesn't make a billion dollars it's a flop for disney now and that is the problem with disney owning all these huge franchises yeah i mean not just disney as well just you know movie studios as as a whole they don't do mid-budget films anymore and you know that that is the age of mid-budget the the age of mid-budget movies is 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 dead it makes me super sad but if you want to see mid-budget movies you have to tune into um streaming services because that's the only place you're going to get them that's which yeah but as we've already said this is very much a film which i think belongs on a streaming service i think if this film had not come out when it did but they were committed to doing uh, a solo story uh, in, in the wake of how well The Mandalorian was received and with The Mandalorian let's not forget that came out of the aborted Boba Fett standalone film because um, there was this whole uh, Josh Trank I think was slated to direct that film and uh, Fan Forstick massively underperformed and uh, there was some controversy going on around that and then they decided to just put that to one side and so Solo was moved up the Obi-Wan film was in um, mired in, uh, you know, will it, won't it, for, for the longest sort of time. But The Mandalorian did great guns. Um, the problem there is, though, the Obi-Wan film, the Obi-Wan series should have been a film and Solo should have been a series. And I think if, if you just flip those two around, I think both would have been much better received. I, I, I mean, honestly, if you put this time, I'd put out the Obi-Wan movie where it's – you know, calling back to that prequel era, which was already having its resurgence and everyone was kind of falling in love with it again. Uh, Ewan McGregor, charming motherfucker that he is. G- give me that film 
when this one came out instead, I think the reaction would have been a lot more positive. With this film, they tried to tell too much. With the Obi-Wan series, they didn't tell enough. It, as you say, it's the wrong way around. But I feel mm. we've digressed away from the film, and I think that's... We're, we're, we're yet again not because, talking because, about the film. It's because we've already done this once. <laughs> that's true. Um, yeah. So, starting at the start, yet another film about fucking space fuel. I actually think Star Wars is more about space fuel than it is about anything else. I mean, you're not wrong there. I mean, again, I don't know if you listen to this, Eric. Love you very much. But once again, space fuel, it's a thing in Star Wars. Uh, although this came out after The Last Jedi, so I suppose he could probably plunge me with that. But yeah, my, my, my point still stands. Uh, I, mean, I mean, my big note for the beginning of is um, it's very blue. Coruscant, it kind of seems <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the, the hidden away place with the uh, the worm lady thing. The, uh, they make the, a the, lot the of <laughs> they make a lot of interesting visual choices in this, and the main one appears to be that they edited the entire thing with the monitor set to half brightness. Yes, <laughs> this is a dark, visually dark movie for reasons that don't have any clear sense to me. Um, I can't work out if it... I, I, it doesn't feel like it was a decision at any point to be made this way. Mm. Um, it just happened, um, which is disappointing uh, because you then... It just doesn't... It doesn't... Again, it just adds to another bit of the, eh, it's another action film. Um, can, can I just give a massive plus to this film, though, which, and I want to be clear, it's because of the time it was made and nothing of, no other reason, but it's clearly not been filmed on a volume. It's because they didn't have a volume, but it's nice that it feels like they have used sets and locations rather than just filmed it in the volume. I would agree. That's because you watched Full Rank All Mankind with me the other day, isn't it? And uh, there was clearly some <laughs> stuff there that you're like, oh, that's been done in the volume. Um, yeah, yeah, but, but, but it, was, it was a big complaint with the Obi-Wan show as well. It is very clearly filmed in the volume. And the volume is amazing technology and it works really well. But when you look at things like this and like Andor and you have a, and, and Rogue One and this feeling that they're actually in locations and in spaces and in places, it's like, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> It's a lot more real and it's a lot more visceral than they're standing in front of. I mean, look, it's, the volume is better than the green screen we had in Attack of the Clones. God knows that. But it's still no substitute for actually being in physical places. I am interested to see long term how the volume has an effect on filmmaking um, and if it's actually for the better, because I think it's going to be for Disney a cheap cheap way out of doing things um, rather they are going to substitute live locations for a volume rather than substituting green screen sound stages for a volume um, but we'll wait and see so the first tableau of this movie is the uh, the chase and then the the worm lady with Han no second name and Kira Good sequence, nice. Does well, it's fun and it, it's fun and it's nice, and it and it kind of calls back to to both you know Ron Howard and George Lucas's origins in American Graffiti. It really has that feel of hot rod racing. Uh, you know, it, it illicitly there's there's a great moment when the uh, stormtrooper on the bike starts chasing after them. I enjoyed the chase. I like the speeder. Uh, it, it, it's fun and interesting. As is always the case, my biggest complaint is we don't spend enough time to really get a sense of a world. And Corellia is a world that is kind of steeped in Star Wars lore. You know, it's where they build the Star Destroyers. I think we spend more time on Corellia in Ahsoka than we did in this. That's because there's no time to spend on anything in this movie. Yes, um, yes you're right. I think, I think my biggest complaint with this start section is we don't get enough of Kira mm, yeah. at all. Um, for her to be so alright cards on the table I think she's well acted I think Emily Clarkson does a really good job but I think it's a really lazy trope to have the the femme fatale you know love interest switch sides um, when we haven't been given the opportunity to get there to get that beforehand you know we don't get to know her enough at the start to feel like she is jaded um and those three years when harm was away what happened to her it's it's it we just don't get enough time with that character it and also it softens harm too much i feel i mean I, I was thinking about this earlier on you know you know if i was to make this film uh i i would almost have her and beckett swap places absolutely 
absolutely, you're right. right. Right down to Han shoots her, him, at the end without hesitation because I want to establish Han as a scoundrel, as someone who will do right. anything. Okay, okay. For a buck. Han Solo's a good guy in this. Yeah, that's the problem, you see. Yeah, they literally, she's like, you're one of the good ones, Han Solo. Well, what's the fucking point in calling him a dangerous smuggler then? Because he's clearly fucking not. He's clearly got a soft heart and everything else. And that just, it undermines the main Han Solo character from the original films. It's it basically, makes- this, 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 this gives us Han Solo at the end of Return of a Jedi, but before Star Wars. And, and what, you, what you have then is a, a suggestion that there's a massive regression in that character, but we don't see it. And as always... If that's the case, if he starts off as a good person and he becomes this jaded, cynical smuggler, show us it. Him shooting Beckett because Beckett was about to shoot him is 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 not the um, uh, 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 the the, uh, the moment you think it is uh, movie in in making us think that oh he's 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 well armed now and he'll do what he what it takes he to survive. He should have shot Beckett <laughs> in the back. It should have been a coward shot rather than mm. a, a standoff. And I like that little Western tableau again, but it's. It just, there's too many missteps in this film for it to be a Mm -hmm. Star Wars film, for it to have the budget it had, to have the quality of the cast in this. I think this is some of the best cast, known actors they've had in a Star Wars film. Um, Rogue One, from memory, doesn't have that amount of kind of pre pre-known talent I mean if you're talking big names I mean this one definitely kind of tops it you know you've got Woody Harlson as Beckett there you've got uh, Emily Clark uh, Fanny Newton uh, Emily Clark uh, Donald Paul Glover uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge uh, you've got Paul Bettany there as Dryden Voss who was a last minute replacement for Michael K. Williams who when they decided they had to go back and reshoot 70% of this film was no longer available so they basically had to completely recast and he recast with Paul Bettany who is a delight and is enjoying that great British tradition of Star Wars films of British actors chewing all of the scenery there's none left by the end of this movie there's none none at all (laughs) Paul has eaten the lot yes Um, and and, and I have to say I think it's great he he goes a long way to uh, keeping my interest in, in, in the film and making it as entertaining for me as it is because every time he's on screen it's just a delight (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah he's having a great time and I think that's the thing you can see some of the actors are having a great time um, but I guess Paul wasn't jaded by 70% of reshoots um, but yeah I think I think going back to Kira it, she is misused as a character in this film and mm. Again, she's given no time to have any heart-to-hearts with Han Solo at any point whatsoever. You know, there is no indication of their closeness of their relationship. You know, is she also Kira Solo? Is actually the word Solo given to all the orphlings or foundlings on Corellia? Yeah. You know, give us That'd that. That would be better. <laughs> that would be really cool. You know, that's that's how it used to work in kind of Victorian England and stuff like that. You know, that's why there's so many people called Smith. And, you know, that was the that was snow in, in Game of Thrones was the same. And, yeah. you know, there's so that's a well-worn fantasy trope. And, you know, that would be that would be interesting you know to me that'd be so much more interesting if when he stood at that booth you know to conscript um weird pro army message in this movie um, oh yeah <laughs> yeah stood there to conscript he said han and they said family name he said solo and he goes nah one of the foundlings or something like you know yeah. there's <laughs> that would take up the same amount of screen time but give us so much more weight to the characters and explain so much that it doesn't need to explain you know and (laughs) Kira is a character I want more of especially where she ends up at the end you know the most interesting thing she does in this is she kills her mentor and 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 master um and and fucks off to work with Darth Maul um hello where is that miniseries please because once once again uh, it it, it is a comic (laughs) (sighs) Yeah, so um, a comic that's hidden behind a, uh, a Marvel comics, you know, ninety pound a year. Um, you know, uh, I mean, you can go and find it in the comic shop, but it's, it's just again, it's comics. People are not going to go and read the comics; they want to watch the film. And you're right, 
do it as a Disney especially, Plus show. But... Especially when you have that acting talent behind it. I can understand yeah. if you were using unknown actors or you know if it was a case of oh you know this was a one-off performance or whatever but it's not this is a this is solid actors where you know you can get that level of of detail and work and why the fuck get these people why get emily clarkson one of the hottest hollywood celebrities at the moment why get her as such a good actress to come and play this one bit part in this one movie because that's a waste of that actor again right well yeah i mean i could just assume it was you know part of it was just thrown at the acting talent which fair enough um, it, I, I, but what, what kind of annoys me as well? You've got the um, uh, Beckett and his crew, which I think is really cool. And and you know, there's sorry, there's, I believe there's a, there's a, they disappeared. But that's the thing. There's a great relationship there. You know, I want to know more about the relationship between Beckett and Ma- and, and Val. Uh, you know, I like Rio with the um, you know the four armed thing. Who 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 is doing the old trope of being inside the uniform of a stormtrooper? You know, it's, it's the two monkeys um, on top of each other. I, th- I think that is great. I'd have loved to spend more time with them and, and let Chewie and Han spend some time with this crew and, you know, become part of it. That's a great Western trope again. And it'll be really fun to kind of see Han and Chewie actually get to know each other rather than just, you know, Han gets thrown into the pit with the beast, uh, decides that they're friends and then, hey, we're going on adventures now. I mean, I don't think that quite qualifies you for a life debt. No. Uh, and... I liked the callback to the Rancor pit with that, but and I liked the subversion of that. But at the same time, okay, where's uh, where's the Twenty One Jump Street movie about Han and Chewie? Because that's what kind of I was expecting. Yeah, you know, they meet, keep the first bit the same. They meet and then make the train. The train heist is that's a whole movie in itself. You know, whole movies are based around train. Famously, whole movies are based around train heists. Oh yeah, and yet oh. it's not even. It's not even like, a whole act in this, is it? it it's, no, it's, it's literally not. It's a set piece. <laughs> and, you know, again, there is no time for characters to breathe. We don't get a time to, to care about any of these people or the characters. How cool, though, was the explosion, though, with that train went up? Oh, my God, it was so cool. <laughs> it was so good. Um, Emphis Ness, I think, again, I, I love the idea of, of you have this pirate there and it turns out that it is the, the formation of the, uh, you know, it's the very, very first um, seeds of a rebellion. Uh, and, and I like the idea that, you know, over the media, we would have been getting these hints before it became a, a whole. But once again, nothing's been done of it since. And it's just such, it, it, it feels like it was put in there just to do a tick box. And, and I hate to use for comparison because it, it's often used by people on the right. But it feels it was put in there just to be, finger quoting, woke. Nothing against uh, the actor have playing the role. It's more though. It doesn't feel like it's organically in this film. It's just like it's a side thought that's just been kind of dropped in for the sake of it. It feels like they needed to get their Warwick Davis quota in this movie. So, uh, yep, <laughs> stuck him in like, oh, there you go. Your face is on show in this one. Enjoy. You even got yeah. a line, a whole line. Woo. Um, yeah, I'm really sad. The Marauders, I really like. Again, it's a strong woman. There's lots of strong women in this movie that we either kill off or don't get any time with, mm-hmm. um, which is, there's very few good women in Star Wars, and we've got two, if not three, in this movie, yet they are blink and miss it appearances, and that's a shame. You know, the Mar- when the Marauders are introduced... Um, the second time, you know, when they've got the, the, the cargo and they've landed on the ship. Yeah. They play some amazing, like, samurai, uh, Asian anime-inspired music to go with them. And later on, you get a very ghost-in-a-shell kind of audio tableau to go with them that is so starkly different from the rest of the John Williams wannabe music in this. Um, it, was, it was a shame, and it was like, oh, that feels like a hint of the film we nearly had. Yeah, I, I, I do love the moment when Han's trying to, uh, to to bluff his way, and he's saying, "Yeah, that ship over there, you know, it's, it's, it's full of elite stormtroopers and what have you." And then it just uh, Lando's just like, "Nope, I'm out," and just takes off at that moment. <laughs> well, that was funny. Like, Donald Glover is an absolute delight as Lando Calrissian, and I, I got to say, I, I think plays Lando Calrissian better than Billy D. Williams does in uh, anything since uh, Empire Strikes Back. I don't disagree. I think he embodies a younger, uh, flashier version of of Lando that makes complete sense that he then becomes the leader of Cloud City later. I can see how he goes from this to that. 
if that mm-hmm. makes sense you know you can yeah. see see the progression off screen and that's okay and you know which is something I, you don't see with Han which is the problem we have <laughs> no because Han ends up in completely the wrong place to be anything other than I just he feels more like he comes out of this film feeling like Luke Skywalker this is the thing isn't it you know because this film is called Solo and he is supposed to be the hero if this had ended with him being the villain it would have been a so much more interesting piece and I think would have fed even further into that kind of western trope where you know you either die the hero or you live long enough to become the villain you know it's, mm-hmm. it's the sense that you know, he, he starts off there he has to you know become the hero later on it, it as I said it would have been great if perhaps instead of Beckett it's it's you know, basically replace Kira, Kira and Beckett so they're growing up together they're going to do this heist this train heist it's all going well uh, she's going to try and you know, screw him. He's trying to screw her, and then it comes down to this. You know, face off. We can team up together and take over the big boss, and we can get away together. And he shoots her because no, he wants it all for himself. That is who Han Solo is at the beginning of Star Wars. This movie is disappointing and forgettable. I I, I agree on both fronts. It, it, it's disappointing. I I, I think. I still am entertained by it. I still I had fun watching it again. It's it's you know throw it on as a as a space western. I'll happily watch it, but it doesn't measure up to the potential that it has in here. There is a great film in here, and I would love if at some point someone who has access to all of the footage from this and from the um, the Philip and Lord cut was was to cut together a ten episode series. I think that would be amazing but it's never going to happen i mean i know they shot stuff of han as uh, a fighter pilot in the imperial navy because uh, one of the ships that they uh, later then use in andor in fact a lot of stuff ends up in andor was kind of created for this film Um, that's really interesting actually well i i I think in the wake of this and then obviously with everything came along with a pandemic i wonder if they repurposed a lot of stuff and a lot of ideas and gave tony gilroy a lot more latitude to make what he wanted to make because they realized trying to force these stories and these directors into a particular box is just not working and obviously disney plus wasn't a thing when this film came out i Um, think that's 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 the big thing i've noticed is watching these films now particularly the disney era all the disney star wars films predate disney plus as a concept Mm -hmm. uh and clearly they were not thinking about it at that point in time or certainly there was no joined up thinking from the department that was working on disney plus to the people making their content because i think if they had an inclination that was coming they would not have made the choices they made. I mm-hmm. certainly don't think we'd have got the standalone stuff. I think that I think they'd have uh, they'd have done the Marvel model far more, where you've got the the big heavy hitter movies and then the TV series kind of padding out stuff and giving us information around it. And it doesn't matter if you don't see the TV series to to watch the movie, or in the case of Doctor Strange, make the movie. Uh, sorry, never not <laughs> never not going to be bitter about how they treat Scarlet Witch. Um, you know, I think. I think they learned a lot from how poorly this went to impact how they did the Marvel stuff. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that has now got its own issues um, of oversaturation. But for the most part, I think, you know, this is what they learned from. And they learned from this movie. You know, this movie cut dead every other, uh, you know, standalone movie they were going to make. Well, I I think what's very interesting is between this and Rise of Skywalker and the critical... uh, pushback not 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 box office because rise of skywalker still made over a billion but the critical response to this they have yet not made another star wars film since these i mean let's let's say going to well and and let's look back at what they announced i mean we were lamenting the other day about the paddy jenkins rogue squadron film that we were very excited for is just not going to be a thing anymore they're not making that Uh, i think the taika watiti one is it's potentially still going ahead but who, who knows there the Ryan Johnson trilogy the one from Benioff and Weiss for Game of Thrones bros that's gone uh, they've announced all of these films and then nothing has happened and I, I feel they're still kind of terrified of the shadow of this film and the rise of Skywalker they should be terrified of the ru- shadow of the rise of Skywalker it was diabolical but, but the, reason it was, diabolical. the reason it was so terrible is because they were trying to appease a very vocal minority of fans yeah, I think Disney has learnt the hard way 
that listening to the internet is not necessarily the win they think it is or no. listening to the vocal people on the internet and I think the game industry does that much better than Disney you know you think the game industry that does um, produce stuff that the audiences don't like and they can go and change it and some some learn from that like Cyberpunk 2077 made huge changes based on feedback and the fact they gave Sky was- <laughs> yeah um no man's sky is is an excellent example where you know it was released and they've spent the last eight years turning it into something amazing turning into the game it was supposed to be at launch (laughs) oh no i give them a pass on this because it was always an indie game and unfortunately it was an indie game that people got to invested in Uh, yeah that's fair um but you know but then you've equally got places like uh Baldur's Gate and and Starfield who got mass backlash for being woke and having pronouns and queer storylines and stuff and they have not given a flying fuck about that feedback and they've just carried on because they're still making the money and people are still playing the games and I think yeah I think the game industry has has coped with that far better than the film industry and particularly Disney and mm-hmm. Warner Brothers which is basically the film industry at this point because there's fuck all other studios anymore sorry Paramount <laughs> yeah. um yeah you know and I think I think that is the mistake that they've they've had to learn the hard way and as you're right they've now they've got shareholders and they expect they expect their billion dollar movies and when your star wars movie doesn't make a billion dollars why not well actually because this wasn't a million uh, a billion dollar idea you know it's a han solo origin story who thought that was ever you know who thinks that's going to be a billion dollar movie I yeah, guess who wanted it? No one did. I, exactly. I've literally written that on my notes. Is no one wanted this film. It feels like a greatest hits reel for Han Solo shoved into a film. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically it. It it's of all of the the characters in you know, I I think for 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 the audience they were targeting Han Solo is perhaps the most beloved, but equally so, I I think the reasons why he is beloved would not translate well into a a film as i said you have to paint him in a particularly bad light and and i think you would then just have people saying oh no that's not you know the han solo i want it, it's it's i'll tell you what i'll tell you what film there's a lot of comparisons between this and between this and the other um into darkness the star trek film i think really what i think what you have there is again is a situation where they decide to bring in khan as a villain and then completely misread the character and why the character is how it is and why the fans respond to that character in a certain way. They think just by the presence of having that character in there, they're on to a winner. And then when they realise they made a mistake, say, oh, well, you know, you don't have to have known the previous character to, to enjoy this. And it's like, well, if that's the case, then why have you done this at all? I, I think the studios, uh, and, and obviously there's, I think it's five, six years between Into Darkness and, and, and this, but I can see a lot of the same mistakes in both films. Oh, well, we can yeah. watch it next year, and and, and, and then you can see I was look, right. <laughs> look, I, suggest, I suggested we did Star Trek next year, and you were like, no. I also suggested... No, no, no. It, was, it was Batman, Batman I said no. <laughs> I also suggested Star Trek. But yeah, I think I can I can see your... your, your the, I can see the point you're trying to make. I'm not sure I completely agree with the... the the, compa- the comparison of the two, but, I, but I, I agree with the broad term that you're making. So you don't agree with the comparison, except that you do. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's basically what you said to me the other day. I don't agree with you, but I do. Um, so I think uh, this is clearly a high-budget movie. The costumes are brilliant. The effects are really good in this, actually, as well. Yeah. But these are things I expect from a movie that costs this much money. Eh? Oh, yeah, and, and it's been filmed twice. <laughs> and watched twice, in our case. Um, yes, indeed. <laughs> but equally, I... I re- I walk away from it feeling nothing at all. I don't even feel angry about the stuff that I want to be better, like I do in Rise of Skywalker and some of the others and Revenge of the Sith. Oh, fuck that movie. Um, you know, no, I Revenge don't... of the Sith is good. It's, it's Rise of Skywalker, the shit. <laughs> um, I don't know. Padme, Padme died, didn't she? She lost the will to live. Um, this also, for me, feels like the least Star Wars movie out the lot. But I don't know. I don't know if that's 
because it doesn't have as many touchstones as the others do. I mean, there's no Jedi in it, is there? So. Except at the end when there is Darth Maul the Sith. Um, He's not a Jedi. I said Sith. But yeah, they, uh, there is no, there's no. I think there's no force in this film at all. No one is force sensitive, or there's no there's no connection to kind of the religion of the Jedi at all. Um, it doesn't feel like it's in the world of Star Wars, and by that I mean when you watch Rogue One, they've painstakingly gone to the extent of making it look like every prop there is something that might have been found out the back of Elstree Studios in the 1970s, even if it's oh, yeah. a new build. You know, um, you've even got the shuttle pilot running around with a pair of old uh, school safety goggles on, you know. It, it feels in that kind of shonky, this film was made on a bit of a budget uh, and things are slapped together and, and, and that's how it is. This film, in a way, feels too slick and I think that's most apparent with the Millennium Falcon. Because, let me tell you, after watching this film, and what we see of a Millennium Falcon in the original trilogy, I am not touching any of the walls in that thing because, <laughs> what have you done, Han? Yeah, how long is it meant to be between this and A New Hope? Because what the fuck has he done to this poor, poor ship? This sentient poor ship, by the way. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. we'll get to the joy bit in a minute, but let's just, let's just frag on a Falcon for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I, there's, there's no point about it. I don't particularly like the Millennium Falcon as a ship, so... You don't like the Falcon as a ship. You don't like the, uh, the Skywalker lightsaber. Is there anything you like about this franchise? <laughs> Do you know what? That's a conversation for the next couple of days, I think. Um, okay. <laughs> no, no. I I think the, my problem with the Falcon is, is the same one I have with the lightsaber. It's just the MacGuffin that's used all the time when there are literally other versions of things in existence. Mm-hmm. You know, we have other ships in Star Wars. We have other lightsabers in Star Wars. Um, less so, I guess, with the ship, but it just... I think I'd have preferred less of the Millennium Falcon in this. I'd prefer it if he won it right at the end in that match. And we just, the last shot was him blasting off with Chewie in it. And then we didn't have to worry about what the fuck happened to this actually really decent looking cargo vessel beforehand. It, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's just bizarre. Um, but but it and reminds this is only me of- supposed to be what five ten years before is it oh I, 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 I found that really difficult as well I had no concept of how long the, the time period was meant to be from one to the next from this to a new hope mm. I was really uh, you know is it you could have told me it was 30 years and I'd have believed you if that you know there was no I, 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 I honestly I don't know how much time is set between them but you're right it, it feels like it's just in it's in the before time but between times um, it, it's <sighs> It, 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 it just feels it feels adrift and it feels Star Wars adjacent almost in, in, in how it's presented it doesn't feel like it is that lived in universe that we have and, and that's nothing against once again but the costumes and you know you've got Star Destroyers a presence you know Stormtroopers a present uh, but it just doesn't doesn't feel real does it which is a weird thing to say about a fantasy space movie with the uh, space wizards <laughs> but it doesn't have any space wizards and it doesn't really do much space stuff either mm. it is very grounded but not grounded in a way that connects it to the wider things you know we go again this to me leads it to being it's actually not a bad fil- a, a bad space western yeah it's a bad it's just Star a bad Wars. yeah it's and, a bad and- Star Wars movie just, just going back to what I said about uh, Into Darkness previously, you know, Into Darkness is a perfectly fine science fiction action adventure film, but it's a terrible Star Trek movie. These are films which they're well made, they are well produced. There's a lot of good acting uh, that's going on in there, but they just do not get the uh, the, the, fr- the franchises and the worlds in which they are. They inhabiting. don't have. They don't have the essence of the mm. of the franchise in them, and you know, sadly for Solo, we are how many? One, two, three, nine movies before it. There are nine movies before Solo setting up this universe at different points. And that's not counting the Ewoks ones. <laughs> no, and I think Solo is a poor product of its time. Oh, very much so. Mm. In terms of physically when it was released and the discourse happening at the time and for, for, for Disney... They hadn't yet got to Disney Plus, and this would have been a Disney Plus series. And we say exactly the same thing about the... the uh, my comparison again to the Black Widow movie, we'd say exactly the same thing about the Black Widow movie. What it was doing was fine, 
it was hampered by so many things happening around it and actually we'd rather watch six episode limited series on Disney Plus. <clears throat> Absolutely. And, and I think what is a shame now is because of this film a- exists, we won't get a chance to explore these moments in, in other ones. I mean, like I never say never, you know, Woody Harlson won't turn down a paycheck if they want to, you know, flesh out a Beckett and Val story, which quite frankly I would be here for. But uh, there's going to be a reticence to revisit it because they will look at this and say, oh, it was a failure. Therefore, we don't want to touch this period, this world, tell these stories. I mean, there was a Lando movie that was mooted for a long time. I think that's now looking like it's going to be a Disney Plus series, but I've also heard it might be a movie. Because, you know, Donald Glover is great as Lando, but the longer it takes and the further away we get from this, the less I think it's likely to happen. I'd be up for a Donald Glover series. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. I think Disney are too scared. And even the Disney Plus stuff isn't doing that well anymore, particularly for Marvel. But we know that knocks on, well, I say particularly for Marvel. Ahsoka had mixed reviews, apparently. Um, people didn't like the last series in The Mandalorian. The Boba Fett thing was odd, and people didn't like Obi-Wan. You know, Star Wars has not done as well TV-wise as I think they were hoping. Well, I, I think this all comes back again to uh, saturation. There's, there's mm-hmm. only so many hours in the day to watch things. And look, you know, I, I love a good burger, but if I have nothing but burgers nonstop for a week, by the end of that week, I'm going to want a salad. And and that's kind of what it feels like right now. They just keep churning it out because it's it's not about stories anymore as it's, it's about content. Uh, we've done podcasts about this in the past, go look them up. But it's, it's very much the sense that they're just churning out content because they want people to be watching it to be subscribed to it so they could turn around to their shareholders and say look how many subscribers we had in this quarter oh yes 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 we're going to do a stock buyback give you lots and lots of money oh yum 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 I think Solo is the tipping point for for me for Star Wars moving from creative stories to content for all I dislike a lot of elements of the prequels it is the sequels and particularly this movie where that change was made you know for all the 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 prequels weren't necessarily that good they had heart or they were lovingly made even if not well made i I, weirdly enough because they haven't made any films in a while i i feel like i'd be ready for a star wars film to come out if it was an event again but the problem is i don't think it can do that without the expectation of okay what's next like even before it comes know. out it'll... i don't know i'm hoping the barbie heimer of the summer and the D movie which did get a lot of hype and did get people into the cinema i'm kind of hoping that's inspired disney maybe to give a star wars movie a go um but i wouldn't want to see it before 2026 27 at this point like Give it well, time. Yeah, give people a chance to make the thing as well. That's our, the other half of the problem, isn't it? You know, don't set the release date and then start making the film. Make the film, then release it when it's finished. But um, that's not the I, Disney way. It's not. And I just wanted to go back to the point you were just making there about, you know, uh, this being the tipping point. It, it, in my mind, I think it's very interesting that we went from the absolute high watermark of The Last Jedi, which I, I will keep saying it, best film in the Star Wars saga, off a cliff. To such a rapid degree uh, I mean that's one hell of a whiplash there I don't think it's this film's fault or, or, or the people who've made it's fault I think it's just a sign of the times and, and I think that's the way things, things happen um, but if I, this I, I had you... come out if this had come out on Disney Plus at the start of 2020 they'd scrapped a cinema release and done it straight to Disney Plus in the pandemic people would have loved it I think so too yeah I do um, even as a three part series I think this would have been great a three part se- a three part 45 minute per section or even an hour you know an hour per per part three part would be brilliant first part he's in the army middle part's the train heist the third part is the um, Kessel Run no, the Kessel Run and the Marauders excellent mm-hmm. excellent three part series same actors same quality much better much better laid out release one a week you know or one every two and a half weeks so people have to do two months of subscription to pay to watch it that's yeah. that's the way to do it and, and, I, we and have- I, I think people would have a really really positive response to it because each of those moments in of themselves are fantastic yep oh yeah that is to me that is the way to to do this um but that's not the way they did do it and it doesn't look to be the way they're going to do it and disney appear to be trying slash doing different things again i look at marvel because it's their other huge property that has this amount of ip and they've obviously done the uh, the what if one a day over the over the christmas break which was a 
uh, I actually think a really smart move. They've been trending online. You know, there's been a lot of conversation about it because people have the time to talk about it. Um, but then they're dropping the Echo series in mid-January as just a complete season dump all at once, which is, again, something they don't do. That is not a Disney model. So... I can't decide if they are A, B testing things and trying to see what works or if they are um, trying to create events and moments like we used to get with Netflix when whole seasons would drop or if they have just lost the way and given up with their projects. I think all they're trying to do is make sure that the share price is at the highest point when they do their earnings calls. (laughs) Cynically, I think the same. Yeah. But moving away from uh, the last thing I want to talk about on Solo, because I don't think there is a we've spoken more about around Solo than actual Solo in this again, yes. because there's not actually that much to talk about with Solo because and, and, and we've already done it once <laughs> and we've already done it once. Um, the droids and the the droid rebellion or the droid uh, liberation droid emancipation. Yeah, um, I didn't think it was handled particularly well. I, th- I, I think, and I've said this before, I, I, I really want to do an episode of Derelict talking about the ethics of droids in Star Wars. Because let me tell you, folks, shit's messed up. The, the oh, fact that you have droids who so are messed up. clearly sentient and sapient. You know, K2SO, you're going to look at K2SO and tell me that that is not a living being. You're going to look at uh, R2-D2 and, and, and say he is not fully self-aware uh, and, and, a, and a living being by any definition. And then at the same time, in this world, you have them being used uh, for, for, for not only dangerous and unethical things, you're using them in armies, and then you're torturing them. Jabba's Palace literally has a droid torture room in it. It's, it's, it's something I've wanted for years. It, it's going like, this is something that really should be addressed. And this is the first film which kind of out and right addresses it. And you have but the. Not um, well, not well in the slightest. As you've said, it's it's just another thing that's been piled into too short of a film. If this was a B plot throughout the series of uh, Solo, like at the very end, it reached the crescendo where then you had the um, the uprising or something, and then that's a suggestion of there'll be a spin off series or something else where it explores that. That would have been great, but it's just not that. It's just it's just kind of shoehorned in, and yeah, it, it's just. A really, really interesting idea, and this whole thing with L three then ending up being the um, oh, it's very the creepy, kind of, very it's creepy. Very, it, the relationship between her and Lando are very creepy. Period. But then also, it just puts every time now when three PO says, "I don't know where your ship load to communicate," but it has a very peculiar uh, dialect. It just you, you 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 are trying to make the Millennium Falcon more than it is. That is a very cool freighter. You're trying to give it an idea that it has a personality I and mean, then it is living in in a, a literal sense rather than in an abstract sense and I find that just a bit cringy I feel like they looked at the TARDIS and they looked at the ships in Star Trek and were like oh, the Millennium Falcon just needs needs to be a bit more special and again I think this adds to my dislike for this stupid ship it's a shitty freighter it's a freighter that takes cargo backwards and forwards. There is no reason for it to be spectacular. There's nothing, there's no hint that there's anything spectacular until we start to make shit up about it, like it's got the brain of L7 in it. L7? L3? L3. L3. Not the band L7. That'd be interesting. No. Um, <laughs> it's got the brain of L3 in it. And Phoebe Waller Bridge does a great job as this robot, as this, as this droid in this as well. And it's a real shame that that's. that's you know, give me a whole Lando and, and L3 series, including oh, uh, the fucking creepy bits. Like, leave yeah. it in, leave that ambiguity. No, I, 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 I love the moment. I love the moment when she's going to jack into the computer and she goes, t- t- turn around. I, I can't do it when you're looking. Okay. I, I love that. It's just funny. I mean, okay, it was ends up just blasting the, the door to get in. But there's a lot of personality and there's a lot of fun to be had there. But it's, it's just wasted. It's wasted. Yeah. And again it's not the acting talent or the even the core story idea that's wasted it what's wasted it entirely is the fact that this is a movie and it's already two hours and 15 minutes long it's not as if it's short but we didn't i'm not even going to fucking talk about the wookie uprising bollocks in this because again we didn't need that in it either it was that is a whole movie in itself it is a whole film about the liberation of this mining colony for the mm-hmm. droids and for the wookies have that as a movie that is really interesting have 
three fucking films about Han Solo if you want and you know the Han Solo Chronicles you know his uh, Han Solo does a uh, conscription and the US Army um, you know advert Han Solo does uh, you know moon li- uh, mining colony liberation and then Han Solo uh, and the Marauders unintentionally he helps set up the rebellion that he refuses to join Excellent. Three movies done. Have Kira all the way through as a love interest, as a as a they tried, you know, and then have her betray him at the end, and him have and to he shoot kills her. her. <laughs> yep. And that is when he hardens and becomes the Han Solo, is because he is then he's never going to love another woman again. Ah, oh, but in a new hope, he meets Leia. Mm. There you go. There's a better Han Solo story. Come back tomorrow. We'll talk about Rogue One. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, I mean, how could we possibly top that? So, so yeah, I, I think uh, probably good, a, a shorter episode for you all today. But you know, as we as we mentioned, a we've done this twice now, and b there's not as much to talk about in this film. So, so we'll, we'll draw solo to an end there. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with Rogue One, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I I think certainly from recollection, and how we've already watched it, but uh, certainly from recollection, Rogue One is a much better film. So uh, let's look forward to that. Huzzah! Rogue One's one of my favourites, so um, I'm excited to, uh, to have to defend it to the hilt if I need to. We probably should have made a joke about how we'll get through this uh, entire podcast series in only 12 parsecs, because a parsecs are a unit of uh, distance and not time. And the fact they went to the extent of making this film just to explain that fluff kind of sums it up. Mm-hmm.